Hey folks, if there's one thing that pulls on my nostalgia button, it's the word Athlon. Back in 2003, and after years of just using the family PC, I finally saved up enough cash while I was still at school to build my first PC. I had been Pentium all my days to that point, so when it came to build my own, I was pretty surprised when the computing teacher sat me down and said, go AMD. But I trusted him and built myself a pretty sweet little Athlon 64 system, complete with the legendary Radeon 9800 Pro, and a hefty for the time 1GB of RAM. And old Mr G was right looking back at my retrospective initial spec list of a low-end Pentium 4 with a GeForce 5800, well that would have been pretty bad in comparison. But times moved on, and over the years both the Pentium and the Athlon branding has changed from being the Halo name to the budget-friendly entry level. And today we're going to be taking a look at AMD's latest lineup of Athlons, which can be had for around £50 to £65, depending on the SKU that you pick up. So what is the Athlon? Well, as you might have guessed from the packaging, it's a Zen-based, and more particularly another Ravenridge-based APU. Which means we've got the cheapest coupling of Zen CPU cores and Radeon RX Vega graphics that you can buy today. The Athlon, well, certainly born from the same Raven Ridge mould, well, they're cut down from the Ryzen branded APUs. And regardless of whether you choose the 200GE, the 220GE, or the 240GE, what you get is a dual core CPU with SMT, which gives you four threads, and three Vega Compute units, which means 192 unified shaders, 12 TMUs, and four ROPs. Compared to the Ryzen branded APUs, we also get a halving of the level of L2 cache. And on a little side note regarding cache, if you haven't already, check out Jim over at Adore TV for his fantastic video on the subject if you want to learn more. Other differences between the Ryzen APUs and the Athlon APUs comes in the form of the locked GPU clock speed. With the Athlons, they're locked at 1000 MHz, and there's also a fixed CPU clock speed, meaning that the clock speed you see on the box, 3.2 GHz, 3.4 and 3.5 for the 200, 220 and 240 respectively, will be the maximum intended speed you're going to be running at or at least that was the case initially. Furthermore, unlike Ryzen-based processors, the Athlon series caps out its supported memory frequencies at 2,666 MHz. What these reductions in raw speed means, however, is that the TDP of the chip is also significantly lowered, down to an absolutely crazy 35 watts. Now, when I got these processors from AMD, I was initially struggling to decide on what to do with them. I mean, a quick squint over to YouTube, and there are already loads and loads of really, really comprehensive benchmark videos, reviews, and even tweaking guides from the likes of good old Mr. Budget Builds himself, and the Low Spec Gamer. So what I've decided to do is set myself a little bit of a challenge. If I'm going to give the Athlon the nod of approval, I think I need to answer just one question. Is it actually enough for everyday use? And by that, I mean, does it feel like a usable product, and not just simply looking at the raw performance figures, but what's the overall feeling of using it as a main system? So for now, my main system, the Ryzen 7 and Vega 64 desktop I do all my gaming, editing, and pretty much everything else on, is getting semi-retired. And to replace it, we've got this fairly simple build. Focused around a first-gen AM4 B350 motherboard from MSI, this one costs 35 quid. 8GB of DDR4 RAM, and a cheap and cheerful Drevo SSD, all housed in a nice value-orientated GameMax Solar ARGB case. There's certainly no frills, but there's enough flair that it could be reasonably considered a plausible build for somebody looking at a new platform at a low price. I mean, this whole system would set you back less than £300. Once I had my OS of choice installed, Windows 10 in this case, it was time to see how the Athlon fares in real life testing, and to be perfectly honest with you, for everyday use, this setup worked absolutely flawlessly. The four threaded Athlon is snappy in Windows, handles general tasks like office work, browsing, and even multitasking absolutely perfectly, and as a basic computer, it ticks all the boxes. For example, playing through YouTube on Chrome, writing a script for this very video, while using Handbrake to try and encode some gameplay footage. There's no hitching, no stuttering, and the whole system is totally usable. Of course, the video encoding is not exactly lightning fast, 
but when we're realistically taxing the setup, it plays nicely and it offers up a good enough experience for the end user. Now, part of the Athlon's allure is of course going to be coming from that Vega graphics integration, and it would be silly not to touch on that. And I'm pleased to report that if you temper your expectations to a realistic level, I'm pleased to say that, well, I was certainly surprised at the performance that the little Athlon provided. Make no mistake, the 192S using the Vega 3 GPU, it doesn't really have enough grunt to play the latest and greatest titles without severe tweaking, but esports titles like CSGO, Fortnite and even the new Apex Legends were all playable to some extent, and more importantly, they were all actually enjoyable, which was nice to see. But what about if you want something to relive the greats of yesteryear at a low, low price? Well, the Athlon range excels here too, unsurprisingly. Half-Life 2, Far Cry and even Crisis are all playable, with only Crisis being what are called taxing. But if old isn't your thing, even new titles can be played with scaled back settings. Resident Evil 2 Remake on the lowest settings at 720p with some internal resolution scalings is absolutely playable at 30fps. It's not really that pretty, but it's certainly playable. So overall, gaming on the Athlon using its integrated graphics can be done, but with that said, I probably wouldn't be too happy if the Vega 3 GPU was my only entry into the PC gaming landscape. But for those of us who feel like that, then there's always the Ryzen 3 2200G or the Ryzen 5 2400G, which have much more robust integrated graphics, featuring 8 and 11 Vega compute units compared to the Athlon's 3. If you are serious about actually gaming on the Athlon, then you're going to want to buy a discrete GPU for that. Now, I'm sure you're going to be aware that on your motherboard, the PCIe slot you slot your graphics card into is probably going to be a PCIe Gen 3 at 16 speed. Now, when you use a Ryzen APU, like the 2200G or the 2400G, this slot runs at 8x speed instead of 16, which halves the available bandwidth. The Athlon takes that down a notch further, giving us PCIe 3.0 at 4 times speed. Now, before you get all worried here, generally speaking, for the types of graphics cards you're going to be pairing with a 50 quid Athlon, you're not really going to need to worry about it. And something like a GTX 1050 Ti, RX 560, or even as I tried, the RX 580, is not going to be hampered by the reduced bandwidth. Yes, the fact it's a dual-core CPU with multi-threading might have an adverse impact on heavily threaded games, but using the Athlon and the RX 580, I've played through games like Resident Evil 2, locked at 60fps, no stutter, and it was silky smooth. In all honesty, it exceeded my expectations of what was achievable from such a budget processor. But there is a flip side to this. Battlefield 5 is an example of a AAA online shooter. And back when I had my Pentium G3258, this game's predecessor, Battlefield 1, made me ditch the 2-core, two 2-threaded two Pentium for a quad-core. But I'm happy to say that the Athlon doesn't suffer quite the same fate as that CPU did. The 4 threads do help here, and although I will admit in hectic online games where the Athlon needs to not only feed the GPU, but also do the math to keep track of online game logic, the Athlon is pretty much maxed out. So that's my general Athlon experience so far, and you might be wondering as to why I've not mentioned which CPU I had been using for any of these tests. Well, there's a very specific reason for that. When the 200GE launched with its locked multiplier, a lot of reviews lamented the fact that it was locked at 3.2GHz, pointing to the inevitable release of these faster 220GE and 240GE models which offer a 6 and 9% bump in clock speed respectively. Now, if you're the kind of person who just wants to spec up a system and leave it as it is, the higher speed Athlons are something you're going to probably want to consider. But for us, the enthusiasts, the Athlon story doesn't end there. With the latest Agisa 1006 BIOS update on MSI, ASRock and Gigabyte motherboards, the CPU multiplier for the Athlons have been unlocked. Now, there's no real clarity on whether this was officially sanctioned by AMD, or why it appeared after the processor was released in a lockdown state, but this is the state of play now, and it's what the value proposition of these Athlons should now be judged on. Using even a modest 35 quid B350 motherboard, I was able to take the 240GE up to 4.1GHz, a 17% increase in clock speed from the base of 35 
and a 28% increase in speed over the base clock of the 200GE. And most impressively of all, even at 4GHz, these CPUs were perfectly happy using the stock cooler. Now I'll admit I was really surprised at the results of the 240GE when overclocked. When the Athlons were unlocked at the end of 2018, I did, like I'm sure you all did, and checked out the revisits from the big hitters of the tech world, and what I seen was that the 200GE, and taking an average of all the big outlets, overclocked around 3.8 or 3.9GHz, which was a great increase when it comes up from 32 and this was what I was expecting to hit, simply because until this point, I'd always thought that the CPUs had just been segregated for marketing reasons and nothing else. The fact that both the 220GE and the 240GE could easily hit 4 and 4.1GHz, it kinda makes me think that these more expensive Athlons might have been separated by something more than just randomness for the sake of market segregation. In saying that, I've only one of each though, so I would be really interested to see if there's any deeper proof as to what I've seen with my samples. But all that to the side, having a chip that can comfortably exceed 4GHz out the box adds a new dimension of viability to the Athlon. Remember I said that in Battlefield 5's multiplayer, the Athlon sometimes felt like it was tapped out, when it was having to feed the GPU and run the game logic. Well, I can say that subjectively, it certainly feels smoother with the overclock. That little bit extra headroom giving the little Athlon some breathing room when it's running such a demanding task. For day-to-day -day usage when overclocked, well, to be honest with you, the Athlon, in my opinion, already performed really well, and I didn't really see any noticeable change when running it overclocked. But for gaming, it certainly felt a bit smoother. So that's the Athlon range in a nutshell. Now with three SKUs, the 200GE being the cheapest, and the 240GE being the most expensive and offering up a 300MHz higher clock speed than the 200GE, with the 220 fitting in the middle. Is it a good CPU? Well, yes it is. For general use PCs, it's absolutely perfect. It allows you to get onto the fantastic AM4 platform really cheaply, which AMD has promised to support through to 2020 with new processors, so there's a clear path here for future upgrades. For a pure gaming CPU with no external GPU? Well, that depends on the game you want to play. For older titles or esports at lower resolutions, it's going to get the job done nicely and at a very low price. But for more demanding titles, the Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5 APUs are just the better option. As for the 200, 220 or 240 question, well, it just depends on if you're comfortable with overclocking or not. If you are, then the 200GE in my opinion makes most sense, as at the very least you're going to be able to match the stock clocks of the 240GE, and likely a couple of hundred megahertz higher. The 220 and 240 are better options for those using a non-overclocking A320 motherboard, or even for those who've got a higher end motherboard but just don't want to overclock. That said, I did see over 4 gigahertz on the stock cooler with the 240GE, so whether or not your 200GE will match that is really going to be luck of the draw. The main thing to take away from this video though, is that after a year or so of 3 figure overpriced Pentiums, there's an option at the lowest end of the market, which is cheap, capable, and most importantly to me, does justice to that Athlon name that I fell for back in 2003. And that, folks, can only be a good thing. But if you've made it to this point in the video, then a huge thanks for sticking around. It's been a fun few weeks using this Athlon, and there's more to come, so hit subscribe to get notified as thermal testing and more in-depth game and performance testing will be coming out now that I've got my big old ramble out of the way. Till then though, take care, and I'll see you all in the comment section down below, and in the next video.